Hey guys, and welcome back. So, you're running a bunch of containers, applications, whatever it might be, but you're not happy with the level of authentication that they provide out of the box. Or, maybe you want to enhance the existing authentication and add in additional authentication workflows. Well, that's where Orthelia can help you out. Orthelia is an awesome authentication platform that is built into your web proxy. Now, Orthelia will intercept incoming requests and it will perform activities based upon the rules that you've configured. So those include no authentication for people that are trusted, maybe just a single factor authentication, maybe double factor authentication for those that you don't trust as much, or perhaps those services that you're exposing to the web. Orthelia is rapidly becoming an IAM, an Identity and Access Management solution, and it complies with the OIDC. That's the Open ID Connect. So you can use Orthelia as an identity platform to verify the identity of your users. Now, this is great because many applications don't have a notion of what a user is. So let's have a quick run through of the features of Orthelia. So one of the main things about Orthelia is it's really lightweight. 20 megs and 30 megs of RAM. That's pretty amazing given what it can do. It's built with security by design. It provides things like single sign-on, which you'll be used to in an enterprise environment. It's really fast because it's written in Go and React. It can prevent things like login regulation through brute force protection. And if you see my other videos where we have CrowdSec built into our proxy, you can see that we're beginning to build up a really comprehensive security suite. You can have authorization policies, putting users into different groups, and then providing role-based access control. This will give you really granular policy definitions. One of the huge advantages as well with Orthelia is, as I've just mentioned, multi-factor authentication, which is pretty much the go-to these days. You don't just want to rely on a single username and password. You want to follow that mantra of something you know, something you are, and something you have. And this enables you to do that. This can also be witnessed in a really seamless integration with things like push notifications to your mobile device. Orthelia will also work with LDAP, so you can build that into your LDAP solution. And finally, it has a nice and intuitive user interface, which should make some of the configuration straightforward. So before we go into the configuration, let's just have a quick look at the overview of Orthelia and where it sits within our technology stack, and also some of the screenshot examples of what this will look like once you've implemented it, just to make sure that this is the right solution for you. So as I mentioned, Orthelia communicates with your proxy. And in this example, I'm gonna show you how to do this with traffic, but it works with many other different proxies. So just choose the one that suits you. You may have to tweak some of these examples that I'm providing today, but the latter configuration part should be homogenous, no matter which proxy you're choosing. So say an external, or in fact, an internal user wants to access one of your services. The communication will come to the proxy, and Orthelia will intercept that traffic, much like CrowdSec is doing to make sure that no bad IPs are accessing it or no bad signatures are detected. Now, Orthelia will take that request and it will check it against its configuration. And it will say things like, firstly, is that user allowed to access this service? If not, block it. Then it will go and have a look, well, maybe they're allowed to use it, but they're in a specific group that requires maybe a single factor authentication or a two-stage authentication. And it will take you through that journey. Now that journey will depend, but I'm gonna put some examples up to show you. So you can choose things like a simple one-time password, you can use mobile authentication, or you might even have a security key, which Orthelia can use. So these are some really powerful tools to enhance the authentication of your applications. And if you're thinking this all sounds far too complicated, there's no way I can install this, let alone administrate it. Don't worry, because it's a Docker installation, again, we're gonna define this using my compose file. You can tailor that to your needs, but broadly speaking, this should work without much alteration. And I'll have you up and running in just a few minutes. It really is as simple as a Docker compose file, 
and a couple of tweaks to your existing proxy. So let's go ahead and jump into a config review. Okay, so I recommend you go and get a brew. This one's going to take a little bit of time to get through, but I promise I'll make this as simple and easy to understand as I possibly can. So on my GitHub, I've got three folders. Now, the first one is Orthelia, which is the container that we want to deploy and the new service that we want to put into our home lab. But in order for Orthelia to work, we need to make a change to traffic. Now, that's just one line, I promise you. So don't worry, and I'll show you that in a moment. And finally, there's an Nginx container. Now I've put that there just as a straight up simple web server to demonstrate how you can restrict access to a container. So you don't need the Nginx one there, it's just here as an example. So let's jump into traffic first because we might as well get the prerequisites out of the way. So for those of you who've been following my videos, this is the exact same config from my first traffic installation. And as I promised, there's only one line we need to add to this. And it's a bit similar to how we added a middleware for CrowdSec. So if you'll see at the bottom here, we've got a new middleware called Orthelia. And basically that does what it says on the tin. It's something that basically sits in the middle, intercepts traffic and analyzes it and compares it to the rules which we're gonna set up later. So when you want to access Nginx, Orthelia will pick that up and it will make sure that the IP you're coming from is allowed to do it. And if there are any special permissions, i.e. levels of authentication that you need to access it. So we only need to add this single line to our Docker Compose file and then redeploy traffic. Now the interesting part, let's head into Orthelia and check out what we need to do here first. But before we go into the configs, I just want to talk to you a little bit about how we can actually set up Orthelia. Now, the config I'm providing here is what I would say is best suited for a home lab setup. Now, Orthelia does some quite advanced things. You can tie it into an LDAP solution if you have that up and running. And you can tie in things like SMTP and all of that so that people can reset their passwords with email. Now, I'm not going to do that, but I'll link the instructions in the description below. The way I have this set up is what's called a manual mode. So we're using a local SQLite database, a bit like we did in my Nextcloud video, and I'm using a file-based user database. Now this is a lot friendlier for a home lab situation, and it's likely that you're only gonna have a handful of users. So big scalability, high performance, those sorts of things, they're not gonna be required, but do know that they exist and do go and check the documentation if that's something you want to go and play with. It's just too much to get into in one video. So let's hop in and look at the compose file to see how we need to configure Orthelia, and then we'll jump into the configuration files themselves, which we will mount into the container as it's being deployed. Now, as with some of my other videos, this is a multi-container deployment. And some of these are optional, but I recommend you put them on. And it's also a good learning curve. So the first one is Orthelia itself. And thankfully, this is pretty straightforward. We simply need to specify the image Orthelia. We need to mount the config, and we'll get onto those config files in a minute. We need to then put it on our proxy network, because as I said, this is going to be reading the proxy logs in real time via that middleware. And that's where those rules are applied and assessed. The final piece of the puzzle are the traffic labels. And there's nothing too new here. The bits that are new are the middleware lines. And this is basically where the forwarding happens so that Orthelia can see the traffic and make the decisions. And if you watch my CrowdSec video, it's very similar to how that works. It forwards the requests to Orthelia from traffic or CrowdSec in that instance. And it assesses the traffic based upon the rules you've specified within the configuration. As I said, this is a multi-container and below this container, we've got something called Redis or Redis. And this is quite a cool container and it's something that's quite handy to preserve the life of your hard drives. So a bit like a RAM disk is to a hard drive, Redis is to Docker. So what Redis does is store key pairs within memory so that it's not continuously writing to disk. Now, this is probably overkill to include it, 
because we're very likely going to have a handful of users at most. But it's a simple lightweight container and it can come in handy for other containers within your home lab. So I'm just going to leave it in here to familiarize yourself with it and we'll likely be using this in future home lab videos. And all Redis requires is a port and somewhere to mount the data. That's it. And you might be thinking, hey Jim, you just said this stores it in memory. Well it does, but it caches it for a period of time before writing disks. So it tends to write it in blocks as opposed to lots of individual read writes consecutively. So now that we've discussed the Docker Compose file, let's have a quick look at the two config files. Now we'll do the user's database first because it's small and then we'll move on to the configuration file itself. So the user's database is pretty self-explanatory. This is where you want to specify all of your users that are going to use Orthelia. Now, this is just set to the default of Orthelia for the user and Orthelia for the password. You just need to change that to whatever you want and add as many users as you need to have access to your services. Do take notice of the groups, which obviously you might not want everybody to be an admin. Certainly if it's friends or family that you don't want tinkering or breaking things. And lastly is the configuration file itself. Now this is a bit of a beast, so I'm not gonna go through all of this exhaustively. As I said, I've called out what I think is a good configuration for a home lab, a decent balance between features and actual administration and maintainability. But you need to go in here and tweak this to whatever setup you want. And if you're wanting to play with this a bit more, you'll need to delve deeper into the documentation to find out how to do that. So quite simply, the most important configuration step here is to put this in dark mode. We want to save those eyes. But no, in all seriousness, you want to go through here and every time a secret is specified, so JWT secret here, you want to change that because I've just left these randomly generated ones in here. You want to change those to your own. And if you watch my previous video on Vault Warden, you know there's a handy generator built in. So that might be another good use for that tool. Go ahead and specify the default redirect URL. This is basically if Orthelia doesn't know where to send you after you've authenticated, it'll send you here. So I've just set that to my root domain, which shamelessly self-promotes my YouTube videos. The next block is the server configuration. And by now, if you've been following my videos, you know that four zeros means it's going to listen on every interface, which is what we want it set to for a Docker container. The port that Orthelia works on by default is 9091, so just leave that as is, or change it if you've got a port conflict. Much like in other videos, we don't need to specify any TLS certificates here because we're using an external proxy. In my set of videos, that's traffic, and that is doing all of the SSL termination for us. So we don't need to touch anything here. Traffic's got us sorted. Now, TOTP, it's not top of the pops for those in the UK. It's time-based, one-time password. That's just a fancy word for, you know, when you use your Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator or whatever else you're using. You can obviously configure those values to whatever you want, but the defaults seem to work quite well. The NTP servers are set to Cloudflare. Now, that's network time protocol, and that is basically how your container, your Orthelia, and pretty much how all computers work, they want to sync their time so that logs are synchronous, things happen in real time. And this is really important for your one-time passwords because you need to make sure that the server and your mobile device or your computer are synced so that when you put in that time-bound password, they're gonna match. Now the next section is all about LDAP and that's the lightweight directory access protocol. Now that's really familiar to most people who work in any sort of identity and access management. As I said, it's probably overkill for most people in the home lab, but if you have an LDAP server set up, you can configure it here. And that's gonna give you things like single sign-on and actually give you a proper identity across your network. But as I mentioned in the intro, I'm not using that. I'm just using a simple file-based authentication, which is what I've just shown in that usersdatabase.yaml. I've set this to use the Argon2 algorithm for encrypting passwords. I don't think it really matters here. They're all secure encryption algorithms. A bane of most people's life is the password policy. Now I've just left this as default because I automatically randomize 40 character passwords through Vault Warden anyway, 
But if you have users that you know are going to take the mic, you can add specific complexity to those passwords to make sure that they have secure passwords. The next section is where we start to talk about the rules, i.e. what somebody can do on a specific site. And that's controlled within the access section. And one of the first things you need to do is to set what's the default policy. So my default stance is a one factor. So a user will have to use a password unless in the section below where we have the network or we have the rules, which are to specific URLs, those will override that default setting. So you can, in the network section, give specific rules for network zones, i.e. you might just want anything locally to be on bypass, so you never need to authenticate with Orthelia if you're at home. But if it's internet facing, i.e. anyone else is using it, trusted or non-trusted, they might need to use one factor or I would recommend two factor. So here you can see that I've set up some URLs that I'm gonna be testing within the rest of this video. So you already saw the Nginx folder. So I'm gonna specify that accessing my Nginx web server, you require a password and to access my traffic dashboard, which we know already has a password on it. But to reach that, you're gonna actually need an Orthelia password. You're gonna need an MFA token, and then you would have to authenticate using traffic as well. Now the session setting is where Redis, the container that stores key pairs in RAM, is utilized. Now this is where the cookies and the sessions are held, such that once you've authenticated and you can specify what the expiry is on that, you don't need to continuously re-authenticate each time you access the site, which is great for user convenience and, and not getting in the way. The regulation specifies how many retries you can get with your password and how long the lockout will be if you breach that threshold. The next section is the storage. And like in many of my other videos, we could use an external database, which would be more performant, but for a handful of users, a SQLite database is gonna be absolutely fine. So we simply need to specify a key here that will be used as a password to access and encrypt that database. One thing you might want to go and set up is an SMTP server. So this will allow users to reset their passwords through their emails and also be notified. Now, I haven't set that up. I'm just using a text file. So when something happens, it's going to reset your password to a text file. This isn't the most secure setup, obviously, because it will be in plain text. But I think it's a good balance for a home lab user and you likely have passwords to access all of your systems anyway and the underlying drives are likely encrypted. And as I said, there's over 1400 lines of configuration here for Orthelia. I've shown you the basics for getting this ready in a home lab in I think a decent balance of security and administration trade-off but I do implore you to go and read the documentation Make sure you understand everything that you're setting and then configure something that's right for you and how you're going to use Orthelia. I would recommend at a minimum any services that you're going to expose to do at least two factors. Now that we have everything configured, I'm going to show you in the Nginx deployment how we actually make use of this. And thankfully, it's really simple. So in the Nginx container, the eagle-eyed amongst you might see one additional line within the traffic configuration. And the amazing thing is, that's all it requires. We simply need to specify the middleware that we created within traffic earlier on. So now that we have all of the configuration set up, it should be as simple as deploying our containers and then testing access to that Nginx container. If this all goes to plan, we shouldn't be able to get to that welcome to Nginx message. Instead, we should be prompted through the Orthelia login command to log in before we can access it. So let's get into deployment mode and let's see if we've done this right. Okay, so once you're on your Docker VM or bare metal Docker installation, whatever you're using, copy over the Docker compose files and the config files to wherever you want to mount these. You can see that I've got the requisite Orthelia, Nginx, and traffic folders here. And these contain my compose files, 
I've also gone into where I store my Docker container data and I've created my Orthelia folder. I've created the config folder in there as we've mapped within the compose file. And then within the config folder, we've got the user's database and the configuration file, which we walked through a moment ago. So once you have those in the right folder structure, you're ready to begin deployment. Now we're gonna deploy in the same order that I went through the configs. We're gonna make sure that traffic is set up correctly first, then we're gonna deploy Orthelia, and then we're gonna deploy a container that uses Orthelia. So in your terminal, make sure you go to your traffic docker compose folder location, and then just run a sudo docker compose up dash D. Check to make sure that traffic's up and running. We can see that in Portainer in the background, my traffic started and it's healthy. And I'm not gonna check the logs just this time because it's working, trust me. But if you need to, and you're using my configuration setup, remember that you can't just click the logs for this traffic installation. You need to go and look at the log file. So with traffic set up, now let's get onto the important part. Let's deploy Orthelia. Now remember, again, we specified two containers within Orthelia. So let's just double check that both of those are running and we can actually check the logs on these to make sure that everything looks healthy. So we can see that Orthelia is running. We can see that it started, it set the logs, it's done a migration. And on the last entry, it's listening to all interfaces on port 9091. So far, so good. Moving to Redis, let's have a quick look in there. We can see that there's a few log entries, but at the bottom, it states that it's ready to accept connections. So that's good. If there were any issues with Orthelia connecting to Redis, it would state that in the Orthelia logs. Thankfully, it doesn't, so I think we're in a good spot. So before I deploy Nginx, given that I've set up Orthelia within traffic, and I specified its address as auth.jimsgarage.co.uk, I should now be able to reach that within my browser just to check that it's up and running. So I'll show you that now. Fantastic. That's working exactly as we wanted it to. Now, you might be thinking, what can you do here if you log in? Well, if you log in now, it's just going to authenticate you, i.e. it's going to create that cookie, and then any containers we assign to be managed by Orthelia, you're going to be pre-authenticated. So I don't want to do that just yet, because I want to show you what will happen when you're prompted using the Nginx container. But for future use, and once you're comfortable and you've validated everything's working, you could just make this part of your daily boot up cycle where if you set your cookie to be live and valid for 24 hours, you just need to log in once per day and you'll then be accessing all of your services through Orthelia, but you're pre-authenticated. So ignoring that, I'm gonna go ahead and deploy Nginx, which really straightforward. So now that Nginx is deployed and just validating that it started correctly in Portainer, we're ready to go and try and hit this URL and see what happens. In my config file, I've just set this as nginx.jimsgarage.co.uk. That's because I'm already running an Nginx web server on my root domain, which is typically where you would put a web server, but you don't have to. So I'm gonna go now to nginx.jimsgarage.co.uk. And as I specified in the Orthelia configuration, this should require one factor authentication. Let's go and test that. So here goes, wish me luck. Excellent. None of that welcome to Nginx. It's saying, no, you've got to authenticate before you can get to my web server. So the default I've left as Orthelia, Orthelia. So let me type that in, hit return, and then hopefully we should be at that welcome page. Bingo, we did it. And it's set up and configured exactly as we specified. It required a password, just a password, no two-factor. So it would be remiss of me to say, I recommend you use multi-factor if you're gonna use this externally without me showing you how to do that. So you might be thinking, I'll go and set that to two-factor. And that's right, but we need to set up two-factor first. So grab your phones, get your Google Authenticator, or whatever you use, and let's get into that right now. So I've hopped back into my terminal, and I've navigated to where the configuration file is, and I've opened that 
and I'm going to edit it now so that my Nginx container is now two-factor. So what we need to do is save this configuration file and restart the Orthelia container. Once that's restarted, Nginx will be configured to use two-factor. Now, you might need to log out of Orthelia first because that cookie will still be set to one hour, which might circumvent the requirement for two-factor, but we'll check that now. So if we restart the Orthelia container, let's now refresh Nginx and see what happens. So now we've refreshed it, it's asked us to log in again. So let's go ahead and log in and see if we're prompted for a second factor. So hopefully if this goes well, we should be asked for a second factor, but we haven't actually configured this. So the first time you do this, it's going to ask you to set up your second factor authenticator. And there we go. Excellent. I told you you're going to need your mobile device. So if we look at this message, it's saying that for your account to access this website, it requires a second factor. But because you've never used this before, you need to register a device. Now, the weak link in this is always if your account was compromised first, your username and password, someone could set up this second stage for their device and use it maliciously. But ignoring that, let's go ahead and register our device quickly so that nobody else can register it on their device. So simply click the register device button and don't worry, it's going to say that it sent you an email with how to do this. Now, we didn't set up SMTP. If you want to go and do it, fine. But remember, we specified a file. So if we head back into our command line, we can access the notifications file. And in there, it will give us the link that we need to use to access to get our QR code. Let's go and have a look. So if we go back to our terminal and we navigate to where the notifications.txt file is, and if we tail that file, don't nano it because it can often cut off some of the token that we require, and we want to copy that into our browser. So let's have a look at it first. And there we go. There's the URL that we need to copy and paste into our browser to generate our QR code. So if you're using Putty, just drag with the left button and it's going to copy it for you. Now let's paste that into our browser. And just like magic, we've got our QR code. So grab your phone, scan that code. You've got your six digit password that you need now as your second factor. So I've got my phone, I'm going to scan the QR code and then I'm going to input that number into my Nginx container and let's see where we get to. So that's now showed up on my phone, I've got my code, let's head back to where we're prompted for the QR code and let's carry on. Let's input the number we've now got stored on our phone. And there we are, I'm back to Nginx, excellent and it's got multi-factor authentication. So well done everybody. We now have Orthelia working with multi-factor authentication. And I've shown you how to specify which URLs you want to apply that to, how to then apply that to the container. And I've also shown you where you can specify in the network blocks if you just want to make sure that certain network subnets don't need to do any authentication, or you can just specify what their default behavior is. And as I mentioned, there's a ton of more advanced configuration and use cases for Orthelia that you can now go and dabble with. But I've shown you the basics. I think Orthelia is a really great tool and it's especially useful for some of those common applications that might not have robust identity and access management. I might come back to Orthelia later down the line when we have a more advanced setup. But for now, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video please subscribe, like, and leave a comment below. Take care, everyone.